Good morning, everyone. Welcome to First Christian Church. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we are glad that you are celebrating this spooky pre-Halloween morning with us. Um, in case you're wondering where I am, I'm back here hiding and, um, behind my base. Um, Nicole is off gallivanting across the warm western coast, so the rest of the praise band soldiers on without her this morning. Um, just a couple of quick announcements before we get started, if I can remember them all. Um, we have an offering plate over by the door to the sanctuary. If you feel so inclined to give, um, you can drop your offerings there, and you can give online at lansingdisciples.org. Um, that plate by the door is also a place where you can drop your prayer cards. We want to make sure that your prayers are heard and lifted up and shared amongst us. So if you have a prayer concern, please drop that card in that plate by the door. Or if you're online, you can drop those in the comments. And our social media manager will make sure that those prayer cards get passed to front and red. We also do a moment of silent prayer for those of you that um, have something heavy on your heart that you just don't aren't ready to share out loud. So... Um, for communion, we, uh, we invite everyone to come up and join us at the table and dip the bread into the cup. Uh, if you need a gluten-free option, those are available out in the narthex. And of course, if you're at home, you can use whatever drink and bread um, are available to you. <clears throat> Hopefully some warm apple cider or hot coffee on this chilly fall morning. Um, First Christian Church is an open and affirming congregation. We welcome all, we want all, we value all. Um, you are welcome and wanted here. So uh, I think that is everything that I'm supposed to announce. I hope I got it all. Um, so now if you are able, please join us and stand and praising with us this morning. Arise, my soul, arise and come alive, dry bones.
Hey, now we have it. Good. <laughs> See, I got made fun of for testing it a few like weeks ago, and Josh was like, I'm going to intentionally like leave it off when you go up there because you always test it first. Sometimes you need to test. So uh, for today's first scripture, it's actually a responsive reading, so I need your help. Um, if you look in the little piece of paper, the program, bulletin, whatever that's called. <laughs> I can't think of the word right now. Um, it's also, I think, going to be on the screen behind me. Um, if you can read the screen behind me, sometimes people can't. So it should be some options. That's <laughs> what I'm trying to say. And uh, just so we know where we're at, this is uh, Psalm 126. Everybody can hear me now? All right. Technology, we'll figure it out. Thank God for the people who, you know, behind the scenes can help us out here. So let's start with the responsive reading. The Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. Then were we like those who dream. Our feet were shattered, and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things. The Lord has done for us, and we are indeed amazed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. We will go out weeping, bearing the seed. We'll come again with joy, O Lord, your King. Amen. And now we have a moment, I think, with the pastor and the children. Hey, hey, hey. Can you sit right here? There you go. There you go. I'm just doing this to confuse you. Um, hi. Um, hi. I'm going to start over again. Um, I got this cup in Jerusalem when I went there a long time ago. Um, actually, I got it in Capernaum, which is near Jerusalem. But when I bought it, it was complete. Yeah, I broke it. Well, I, I, what happened was is I took, brought it home, and it was fine. I carried it around when I had it for a long time, and it was fine. Then we moved to England, and it was fine. And then I carried it around England for years, and it, it was fine. And then they brought it to America, and it broke. So, yeah, you want to take a look at it? Be careful. The edges are sharp. Now, you might wonder why I kept it. Why would I keep a chalice that's broken? Because it reminds me of my trip to Israel. And the, uh, the little mosaic on the outside, if it were complete, you could see that it has two fish and a basket. And it's because it represents when Jesus took 
five loaves and two fish and made them to feed 5,000 people. 1,000 people. See? The reason I keep it, the reason I hold on to it, is because it has wonderful memories for me. And it doesn't bother me that it's broken because I don't use it, never use it for what it was. I actually had a candle in it. That's why it's got black on the inside. But, no. Um, but it, uh, it's something that's very important to me, and it doesn't matter to me that it's broken because broken or restored, it still reminds me of my trip to Israel. Now, what I want to talk to you about is sometimes we're broken. You ever feel broken? You ever feel sad? You ever feel bullied at school? So many times. And sometimes people can make you feel like you're broken, like there's something wrong with you. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with you. Because God still loves you. And the people here love you. And the people over there even love you. And which is kind of cool, don't you think? Yeah, see? Yay! So even if your body is broken, like some of us are, uh, even if your heart and spirit feel broken, like some of us do sometimes, it doesn't matter as much because God loves us and others love us and we love each other. So let's pray. Thank you, God, for loving us. And even when we're broken and even when we feel that we're not worthy, we know your love has made us worthy and your son has called us to be together. Be with us and guide us today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. figure it out eventually. <laughs> Our uh, second reading is from Mark, uh, but now that I've flustered myself, Mark 10, 46 through 52. Um, it should be on the screen behind me, but it's always nice to hear, right? Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. May the Lord lend um, their blessing to this message. Well, good morning, everyone. How are you doing this morning? You okay? You all right? Good, good. That's, I'm glad to hear that. Well, one of the things that is always intriguing to me about reading the gospel is little bits of things that they don't really teach you in seminary, or really little things that you don't notice when you haven't read it 412 times. Or really things that you don't find when you're doing a devotional sometimes, and you read something that you hadn't thought of before, and it kind of piques your interest. And that's what this passage did for me this week. Because sometimes the scripture tells us about the people who Jesus comes in contact with. Sometimes the gospels name them. All four gospels have this account, but only two name the person. We know sometimes about particular people. We hear a story of the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, which they never mention his name because nobody mentions the mother-in-law's name anyway, do they? 
No, we don't know her name, but some we know about, like Mary Magdalene, who was healed from seven demons, or Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. People that the people would have known and whose names they would have recognized. Our story from Mark names the particular person in this healing. His name is Bar Timaeus, or son of Timaeus. So that means that either Timaeus, or Bar Timaeus, or both of them, were known to the early church. Bartimaeus represents the people of Israel. He represents the disciples themselves, and he represents us today. We, like him, are broken and need to be restored. We heard in the Psalms that there is a cry out for Israel to be restored. We have been destroyed. We have been restored now. You have restored us. You have made us whole again. The Jews have always been a people of captivity. Most of their history, they have been in captivity. 400 years in Egypt. Years since World War, of, in the World Wars when they were in captivity. Even now, in some places in the world, the people of Israel still feel captive to their neighbors. But the one thing about the Psalms that you always get, even the ones that are that seem depressed, and even the ones that seem overwhelmed by the captivity, you see always a hope of restoration and redemption. There's always that hope. There is that hope in this psalm. There's the hope that the healing is going to come about, and we're going to be a part of that healing, and we're going to use our mouths and our tongues, and we're going to shout for joy, because Israel restores glory is a time of joy for us. This is a, a psalm of King David. His success as king was a sign to all the people of the blessing of God. But in Jesus' time, Israel was in captivity, the captivity of Rome, like most of the world was at that time. So the psalm may not be a one of celebration for the the immediate present, but it is a sign of hope for the future that one day Israel will be restored. One of the things I noticed about this reading that I hadn't noticed before, and I love that when that happens, is what Bartimaeus says is, restore my sight to me. Let me see again. Which means that Bartimaeus could see at one point. But somehow he lost that sight. So it wasn't that he was born without the ability to see. It's that he had his sight taken away from him somehow. Whether it was an accident or disease, we don't know. But the fact that he, had, that he says, let me see again, means that he had sight at one point. He had had a normal life. He'd had a life where he grew up and where he studied the scriptures and he went to synagogue and had a normal life and maybe even had a wife and a family, but he lost his sight. And so now he was an outcast. Now he had to beg for money. He had to beg to live. And he was pitied by people. And nobody really wants to be pitied, do they? But then he heard about Jesus. You know, you wonder what people who don't speak a lot or what people who are disabled or how people who are out of the norm of life, how, that they perceive the stuff that's going on around them. If you've ever been in a hospital room and somebody has been there who's a carer for you and have the nurse or the doctor talk to them and not you, you can understand what that feels like. It feels like, excuse me, I'm here. Hello. Can you talk to me for a bit? A patient over here. It feels like you're left out. But we hear the things that go on around us. And that Bartimaeus heard about Jesus. And he took his shot. He took his chance. 
Jesus was walking by and he called out to him. And the people tried to say, be quiet, be quiet, don't bother him, don't bother him. But Jesus heard him and said, what do you want? It's amazing what he didn't ask for. If you were walking along the way and Jesus came by and he said, what can I get for you? New car, bigger house, better job, nicer family. No, that's not true. What could you get? What could I get for you? And what does Bartimaeus want? To be normal again. To be like everybody else. To be able to go into the temple himself. To be able to go here and there. To be able to not have to beg for his livelihood. Just wants to be normal. So he takes a shot. And even when they tell him to be quiet, he keeps going. Even when they say, be quiet, he keeps asking for help. And I wonder about people who have gender dysphoria, who aren't seen for the person that they really are, and who, when they ask for help, are told to be quiet. Be quiet. You're bothering the master. Or people who are ill and struggling, people who have difficulty going through life normally, or normal as other people say, because remember, normal is just a setting on the dryer. <laughs> they want to be normal. We want to be normal. We want to be the people that we think we are in our own heads, and that's a good thing. And people will continue to tell you to be quiet, but don't listen. Keep standing up for your rights. Keep standing up for your beliefs. Keep standing up for who you are. You know, I think about that, about what we have lost, and sometimes I think my biggest regret is that I've lost my youth. I remember he had, the brain is a, is a wonderfully terrible thing, because I remember when I was younger that I used to run upstairs two at a time. Now I can barely get up one at a time, or do that shuffle, that one foot up, one foot up, one foot up, one foot up. And you think back, well, what have I lost? But what I've lost isn't that big a deal. We think back about the things that we've said, <coughs> that we've said to people, the angry things that we've said that we can't take back. But the angry things that remember, remind us in our head, that stay in our head, that stay in our thoughts, the ones that we've said and the ones that we have left unsaid. Maybe we forgot to say, I'm sorry, and our loved one has passed. Maybe we forgot to say, I love you, and some terrible thing has happened. Or maybe we just forget to say it because we think the person knows it already, and you know, it's good to hear somebody say, I love you on a regular basis, isn't it? I love you, but keep that in mind. It's good to hear that. It's good to say that. It's good to know that that relationship is there. And we don't want to have that regret. But we long for a time when we were younger. Oh, when I was younger. Oh, when we ate. What does the, what does the Israelites say? Oh, when we ate flesh pots by the, in, in, in Egypt. Oh, when it was easier back in those days. We forget about making the straw, making the bricks without straw. We forget about that part. And the beatings, we forgot about that. We think back and think when things were simpler. I hear people say, oh, I never talked back to my parents the way those kids talk back to their parents. And I think, really? That's not how I remember it. Joyce tells a story that her mother used to say, when you get your own house, I'm going to come over to your house and jump on your bed. Things were simpler back then. The boomer dream is, oh, back in my day, gas was 22 cents a gallon, and houses were $14,000, too. So it, you, know, you have to kind of put things into perspective. 
Back in my day, things were easier and simpler. Make everything back like it was when I was growing up. When black people couldn't sit at a counter and have a sandwich with everybody else. Make it good in those days when, <coughs> when people with gender dysphoria, people who were trans, couldn't do what they needed to do to feel like themselves. People who were gay were bullied and arrested and some were even killed back in the good old days. We don't want to return to that, do we? It may be scarier looking forward, but it's even more scarier looking back. So how as a church have we lost our way? Ah, remember when the church was full. You ever hear anybody say that? Oh, I remember when the church was full of people and children were everywhere. And the old people complained about that then, didn't they? <laughs> oh, I remember back in the old days. Maybe it's because we miss the people who have moved on or died and wonder what it would be like if they were here with us today. But looking back does not help us. Looking back keeps us in the past. Staying, staying blind and deaf does not help us to move forward. Because I can tell you, my brothers and sisters, my siblings, it is never going to be like that again. It's never going to be like it was in the 50s. It's never going to be like it was in the 20s. It's never going to be like it was in the 70s. It's never going to be like it was in 2000. We hope it's never like it was in 2020. <laughs> but it's never going to be like that again. And that's okay. Because if you go back to then, I'm not here. And I really like being here. And some of us are here who wouldn't have been here. The past doesn't include a lot of us in what the future is going to be. The past is the past. Sometimes we have to take the shot and say, heal me. I'm ready for a new life. The people of God were broken. The system was broken. The religious leaders focused on following the laws and using the laws to their benefit, not how God intended it. Sticking strictly to the letter of the laws until it doesn't fit, and then they can put a little caveat into it. That's what addendums are. That's what uh, ways of skirting the issue. All men are created equal, except for black people. All people are created equal, except for women. But everybody else is okay. If you're a white landowner, you're fine. system is broken. Jesus upset the religious leaders because he was trying to get us to see what God really intended, which was love and service, not following laws. But the religious leaders enjoyed the attention they got. They made a lot of money in ministry by cheating the poor. If you went up to bring your offering of birds to the temple, there would always be a problem with one of your birds. So you couldn't bring your offering. You had to buy their offering. And the money changers, you know, you see here read the story about Jesus and the money changers. It was because all the coins were Roman because it was in captivity. But the temple didn't accept Roman money. So you had to bring it in and exchange it. And if you've ever gone on vacation internationally, you'll know that the exchange rate is something that can really mess you up. And so they would come in and they'd have to bring in their Roman coins, and of course they'd have to change them into Jewish coins, and of course there would be a fee, as there always is. So the religious leaders were not out for the will of God. They were broken. They needed to be repaired. Bartimaeus' life was broken. He was an outcast. He could not take care of himself. What he needed to do was be fixed. And Jesus was his best hope to have a normal life. Some of us are in need of repair. 
some of us are original with new parts. Knees, different parts of the body like that that we need, and things in our shoulders. Different kinds of things that we need repair from in order to have what we think is a normal life. But you know, what we really need is not new knees, although those will help, won't they? What we need is a new spirit. Because our current situation doesn't fit what our spiritual and life situations are. That means you have to learn more than you learned in Sunday school about the faith. Because that will only take you so far. You need to have that, but it will only take you so far. And especially if you grew up in the 60s like I did, there's a lot of change that things have changed since then. We need to understand more about what it means. We need to grow in our faith and in our spirit. Because if we have just our Sunday school answer, Maybe it doesn't, I'm sure it's different than you are teaching. But when I was teaching, I didn't understand how bad things could happen to me if God loved me. It was hard for me to understand being in, focusing on that third grade Sunday school education. And why bad things happen to good people is that bad things happen to all people. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. When people say, you have to have enough faith in order to be healed, I said, I usually say, Jesus must not have had enough faith then. Because they killed him. So you have to rethink sometimes what all this means. We need to remember that hate is not from God, that we need to have that part of our spirit that is angry and hateful. We need to have that repaired. We need to remember that love means loving everyone, even people who might vote differently than us, even people who might not look like us, even people who are angry with us, and worse even, maybe people who don't even think about us. I have family members, God love them, who are very happy when they see me, but I'm not sure could pick me out of a lineup if I hadn't seen them in a while. We love you, Johnny. That's what they say. And I've, I have no doubt that they do. But love means loving everyone, not just the people you like and not just the people who like you. Even the poor, even the lame, even those who are blind, even those who make themselves into a nuisance like Barnabas did. I had a friend of mine that said, if the Holy Spirit ever came into a disciple's congregation, he'd have to sit in the back and be quiet like everybody else. We get nervous when people call out in the middle of worship, don't we? I get really nervous as I'm preaching and somebody goes, Amen! I go, what, what did I say? I'm going to go back and look. What did I say? Did I got that? We get nervous when things <coughs> happen that are different and unusual. But that's good. Because everything is going to be different and unusual in the kingdom of heaven. So we have been restored, repaired, and now we are being made new. Jesus makes all things new, the scripture tells us. The law is not about following rules, it's about action. It's about how we can change things. Jesus said, you've heard it say, but I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't call anybody fool. If you hate somebody, it's the same as murdering them. Jesus changes it all. He offers us a new path, not an easy road. It's a road kind of like a back road in Michigan. 
full of potholes, weird turns in places you don't expect. But it's okay because God's with us along the way. And sometimes the people who travel with us are weird or unusual. Well, I say God bless the weird because I'm one of them. God bless the strange. God bless all the ones who call out when they're supposed to be quiet. Who take the chance, who take the shot to find healing and love, even when other people tell them not to. Bartimaeus was healed, but that was not what he really needed. Let me see again was all he asked for. And that was simpler than what Jesus really gave him. Because at some point in Bartimaeus' life, he could no longer see. At some point in Bartimaeus' life, he died. But what was changed was his spirit. He didn't understand that it was his spirit that needed healing. He was still living as a person of captivity, living as a person of disability, disabled not so much by his inability to see, <clears throat> but in his inability to accept God's love for him. And it's hard to, em- to give somebody water in their bucket if your bucket is empty. It's hard to love other people if you don't feel like God loves you. But he was made well in body and spirit. He was healed and better than before. And not only that, he became a follower of Jesus. To me, the good thing about that is that even old dogs can learn new tricks. Changing our habits can be difficult. Looking at people that we used to look at askance can be hard to do. And looking at them with eyes of love and the eyes of Jesus. It can be difficult. Healing his sight was easy. Changing his lifestyle and his thought, that took the rest of his life. Allowing ourselves to grow spiritually, challenge our ways of thinking about things that we always thought were true. That's what seminary does for you. Most people flunk out the first year of seminary, not because the work is so hard, but because they can't let go of the things they were taught growing up. I remember a class (laughs) where the professor said, because, you know, they used to copy the manuscripts by hand. So there would be somebody up front reading out the manuscripts, and the people would be copying them by hand, the monks would. So it it said, if a dog barked in the middle of the transcription, could change the entire meaning of the passage. That scared a lot of people. Because if you focus on the English translation of the Bible, you can really get lost on what it means. Did you know that people were put into prison and killed for translating the Bible? Did you know that? Did you know that people who interpret the Bible one way other than the traditional way get excommunicated? Or murdered? Sometimes it's difficult to think a new way and to move forward a new way and to be a new person and to be a new church. The only way that we can change ourselves and change ourselves as a congregation is through prayer and study. There's no other way to do it. There's no other way to do it. We can't hope it. We can't wish it. We can't hope and wish it would go back to the way it was. The only way to move forward is prayer and study. church is not ours, my siblings. The church belongs to God, and the church exists for the people who aren't here yet. When the church thinks of itself as the last one who leaves to turn out the lights, it's already dead. When the church focuses on, we've never done it that way before, or 
his sister, we've always done it that way before. It's already done. The past is the past. The future is what it will look like for the generation that's not even here yet. I remember I did a, a study once and I had, had young, young kids, about your age, design a church. And so instead of pews, you know what they had? Easy chairs. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Of course, half the people here would be asleep by now. But Imagine chairs. Imagine easy chairs. Imagine we did church differently. Imagine that we had mixed things up and we had communion in the middle or in the beginning or at the end or someplace else or... Imagine people making decisions that we haven't done for a hundred years. Imagine women preaching. Ooh. Imagine trans people preaching. Ooh. No, I'm just I'm just saying it, it's something that we that would have been difficult. 20 years ago, but certainly isn't now. Isn't that wonderful that it isn't now? Isn't it wonderful that we don't have any problem with women elders? Isn't it great that we don't have any problem with people of all ages and abilities and genders and life situations sharing the gospel? And it's only be when we're willing to take that next step and see what's beyond us that frightens us and move ahead that we begin to become the church that we even are today. Bartimaeus learned a very important lesson. A lesson that Jesus had in mind for the future. <coughs> and that his life is more than just a dream. Life could be a reality when we seek to be healed. Being healed is just the first step. Accepting Jesus is just the first step. One of the things <coughs> that I say in my book is that when I talk about communion and children having communion is that communion is not the cookie you get for passing the class. It's participation in the family of God. It's the food for people who come. It's not about achieving something. It's not about getting a reward. It's not like, well, I did that. That's off my bucket list. It's about, okay, now that you've taken that step, how about the next step? I've never run a marathon, and I probably never will. I know that's shocking to some of you. But I have walked further than I thought my body could go. And realizing that just one more step is all you need to do. You are restored. You are repaired. You are welcomed. You are the leaders of the future. So such a good job knowing when I'm getting toward the end. That's pretty good. Do I have that much of a tell now? Is that, have I been here long enough that I have a tell that you know when I'm coming toward the end? Goodness, I'm going to have to shake it up a bit. I'll, but in the name of Christ, offer healing to the world. Now that you've been healed, offer healing to everyone. Now that you are a part of the healing of God, share that healing with the world. Amen. So, now we're going to sing, I guess, huh? Okay. Uh, immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, number 66.
to use the little boy's room. Take your breath. <laughs> Take it, breathe in, breathe out. I'm going to offer up a prayer for all of us. And during the prayer, there will be a moment uh, where I hold some silence. So those at home, if your sound did not go out, and those in the sanctuary and at home, it's a time to lift up the names and prayers that are on your heart or you don't have words to say. At the end of the prayer, together we will join, this is why I don't run, in the words of the Lord's Prayer, say the words that are most meaningful to you, but if you do forget or need some guidance, they will also be on the screen behind me. A couple more deep breaths. Please pray with me. Loving God, as the election approaches, we ask for hearts and minds that are open so that we might see each other as siblings, one and equal in dignity, especially those who are victims of oppression, abuse, violence, deceit, and poverty. We ask for ears that will hear the cries of those abandoned, people who are oppressed because of their race, creed, religion, gender, ability, or sexual orientation. We ask for minds and hearts open to hearing the voices of leaders who might bring us closer to your kingdom. Awaken all your people to a commitment to justice for all people and for your creation. God, we also lift up today individuals that we have in our minds and on our hearts. Pam lifts up a message from Jane. Prayers of thanksgiving for Bob Hanna's recovery, positive recovery. I think it says it's very positive, positive. And prayers, prayer requests from Shauna for the family of Karen Felposh, my husband's aunt, as we last lost her to a sudden brain aneurysm this week. And Lord, we leave room in this space for all of those prayers that we might not have words for or can't speak out loud. Thank you for being our blessed comforter and our peace. We ask you to take all of these prayers, raise to you, and breathe new life into them. Let each person feel your presence in amazing ways and assure them you are always with them and surrounding them in your love. We ask all this through Jesus Christ and pray in the words he taught us. Our Creator, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Number 101, James Jesus, the joy of loving hearts. They really run the show. You can Thank stay you. seated for this.
institution, we talk about the body of Christ broken for us. And Jesus says, take, this is my body broken for you. But the story of the crucifixion doesn't have the body of Jesus broken. It's not in the story. So what does Jesus mean by that? Well, let me give you one interpretation. It's not so much that his body that was broken as it was his spirit. And it's not so much that our bodies are broken when we come, but those of us whose bodies are broken can, and those of us whose spirits are broken are very much invited. It's the table of the Lord. It's, it's Christ's table. It's for all of us who are broken, for all of us who need to be repaired, for all of us who need to be restored. <coughs> it is the table of the Lord, the body broken for us, the blood poured out for us, the love given to all of us. So we come at his invitation to share in his feast. We remember that on the night when our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And at the conclusion of supper, he took a cup and again he gave thanks and he said, take all of you and drink from this, for this is my blood of the new and everlasting covenant for you. And so when we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim his death and celebrate his resurrection until he comes again. Please pray with me. God, we are reminded that love is action. As you actively love the world, we must actively love each other. We must push past our comfort zones, reticence, and general inertia, allowing ourselves to be moved by the engine of love. We confess our tendency to withdrawal, we confess our desire to put away our own safety and convenience above all. We confess our quickness to downplay the needs of the poor, the plight of the injustice. We confess our self-centeredness. We ask for hearts aflame with the love of Christ. We ask for patience to endure suffering. We ask for courage to pray for and love our enemies. We ask for strength to accomplish the work of peace. And we look to Christ the model of loving sacrifice, and to those saints through the ages who have lived and died for the cause of love. May we act with confidence and boldness and find our reward in the joy of your presence. Amen.
I know for a fact. And then I have to put it down here. You probably don't have all the pieces I need. No? All right, some announcements. Uh, there's an the upside down bulletin, insert. Um, there's some community events, uh, but I also want to draw your attention. If you weren't aware, uh, the Regional Assembly for the Michigan Region of Disciples of Christ on the 18th and 19th, we voted to for the intent to merge with the Illinois-Wisconsin region. There's a lot of information on the website and YouTube videos that explain what that means for our region. Uh, if you have questions, you can also talk to John and I. We were at the meeting. Um, there's also a very important insert. Two Sundays from today, it literally says important news in big red bold inside. We will have a vote in person here in the sanctuary. Those of you that do watch on home, I am sorry, but because in our bylaws and stuff, this type of vote has to be in person. There will be no absentee or proxy or online voting for this. So if you want to vote in this, you do need to come in person. Um, we will. We have received an offer on the sale listing of our building, and the general board voted and approved to send a to send that offer to the congregation to discuss and vote. And the details are on the insert. I'll read right here. Um, but on so on Sunday, November 11th, we will have a congregational meeting to vote right in here after the service on whether we would like to accept this offer. The offer is from the Gillespie Group. It is a cash offer. They will deposit $25,000 earnest money upon acceptance of the sale. They would like occupancy by April 30th of 2025. If you have questions, you can ask a general board member, or if you need something very specific, then reach out to Josh by email. And just to clarify, we are planning just to move. We are not closing. Nope. We're they, not stopping. Yes. Yeah. We're just making a change. Changing moving forward. Yep. Like starting on a chapter. Oh, and yeah. And Carol, Carol has an addendum announcement that. Here we go. Carol, you better. Uh, uh, we're getting close to the turkey feathers. I would expect to hear from Christian Service within the next few days, and uh, as soon as I get the feathers, we'll put them out on the bulletin board. Um, just a reminder, when I get the names, I immediately call each family just to reassure them that their names have been taken and that we are in charge. And when you call, whoever is going to be delivering each family, just a reminder, when you call them, immediately you can tell them your name, but identify that you're calling about the Thanksgiving basket, your first Christian church, and you have received their name from Christian service because it causes a lot of anxiety for you or I when we get telephone calls that we don't know. And particularly with them, we need to be very sensitive. And also a reminder uh, to call them in advance. Uh, you know, in the past couple of years, I've given them a choice of ham and turkey, and I was surprised at how many took ham instead of turkey. I'm not going to do that this year. I'm going to leave it up to you so that you can correspond with that family and get more familiar with them. And um, But we will have the same setup as I always have had. If, if there are people here that are not sure what I'm even talking about, see me and I can explain. This is a tradition this church has had for, I can't even tell you how many years. Many, 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 many and um, it's just heartwarming to be able to supply a Thanksgiving dinner uh, to those that need. And um, I made myself some notes because I, but we're following, we're not doing that for first, from First Christian Church. We're doing this in a commandment from God to love one another and to serve one another when there's a need. So that we just need a reminder. This isn't honoring Christian or first Christian is honoring God to do this and um, I believe that's it and hopefully maybe by next Sunday we'll have the turkeys feathers out so that's it. Oh. Well, we like to, to uh, offer anyone the opportunity if they would like to join the church or to rededicate their life to Christ or come forward for prayer.
prepared to do so as we sing our final hymn. Our final song being Days of Elijah. There you go. Okay. Please stand and sing with us. <laughs> Two, three, four. 